want to thank the Rachel Carson Center for the fellowship and the opportunity to present today what has been two and a half decades of work in South and South America, but to present today two aspects, the conceptual framework and also the application of that conceptual framework. And I will focus on the biocultural ethic that values the vital links between the co-inhabitants, their life habits, and shared habitats. Today we're consuming the biosphere and mostly without a conscience. And I will focus on two gaps. One, the suppression of ethics, and the second, the asymmetry between the northern and southern hemispheres, mostly in terms of monitoring and understanding the whole picture. Regarding the first gap, it is important to start saying that the great acceleration has been driven by a grand narrative of economic progress, resulting in processes of biocultural homogenization and suppression of vernacular knowledge, practices, and values. This is stated clearly in a foundational document of the United Nations in 1951, which states, Rapid economic progress is impossible without painful adjustments. Ancient philosophies have to be scrapped. All social institutions have to disintegrate. Bonds of caste, creed, and race have to burst. And large numbers of persons who cannot keep up with progress have to have their expectation of a comfortable life frustrated. Very few communities are willing to pay the full price of economic progress. To revert these processes of biocultural homogenization and oppression, to reorient them toward processes of biocultural conservation, I will present the framework focusing on the three ages of the biocultural ethics. These are the co-inhabitants, the habitats, and the habits. Note that each of these has biophysical dimensions, symbolic, linguistic, and cultural dimensions, and the blending of blue and yellow produce green with the aim so that to inform institutional, social, economic, and political decision-making and designs to be informed by both the biophysical and cultural diversity. And this is informed in a participatory way by Native American and other traditional ecological worldviews, by no mainstream Western uh, traditions of philosophies, and also contemporary ecological and evolutionary sciences. So the cornerstone concept is the concept of co-inhabitant. And I coined this term in analogy with the concept of companion, which originally allude to sharing bread, cum panis. So in this table, you see the family and friends sharing the food. If one would eat all, would become obese and the others would starve. Similarly, the notion of co-inhabitants allude to sharing a habitat. And here you see these two women from the Aymara communities sharing among them, but also with the potato plants, leaves of coca, etc. So they are sharing a habitat with the human and other than human co-inhabitants. And this concept has implications that are in epistemology, ontology, and ethics. Briefly, regarding epistemological implications, it is necessary to overcome the logic of the specimen, which has prevailed in modernity and still today, in which animals and other living beings have been studied as individuals separated from their native habitats. There is this emphasis that needs to be corrected toward a stronger logic of co-inhabitation in which living beings, both humans and other than human, are studied in their interdependency with other beings. Ontological implications. It's interesting that the word human comes from the Latin humus, which means soil. So somehow humans are people of the land in the world. And this understanding that comes out of the origins of Western civilization today is corroborated by geochemical sciences. Native American worldviews, in this case, the Mapuche and Pehuenche people, 
in South and South America also share this strong linguistic and biophysical intersection with their habitats and co-inhabitants. Mapuche means Mapu, land, like volcanoes, rivers, rocks, and Che means people. So these are people of the land. And Pehuenche means people of the Pehuen, the monkey puzzle tree. Here we see in this diagram the sulfidric acid coming out of the volcanic emissions. Then in the microbiome of the soil, this is transformed into sulfate as sulfate. It is absorbed by the roots of the monkey puzzle tree with organic metabolism and reaction to produce, to generate two amino acids that are the only ones that contain sulfur and one of them is essential. Therefore, by eating this table food of the seeds of this monkey puzzle tree, the people are healthy, but also they have the sulfur of the tree in their bodies and the sulfur of the volcanoes of their bodies. So there is a biophysical concrete reality in the world that is also in the cultural symbolic uh, language of Pehuenche and Mapuche. Similarly, in Central America, we know the people of the corn and this um, wall painting uh, shows faces of people on the sides of a corn plant showing a non-hierarchical relationship of co-inhabitation. This ontology and epistemology is at odds, is in contrast with what prevails today, which is denounced here by Joaquin Rodriguez del Paso, Costa Rican painter in his painting Biodiversity, where he denounced what is going on and appeals to us that it is imperative to resolve the social environmental injustices that objectify, exploit, and commodify human and other than human beings, and to restore appreciation for the rich biological and cultural diversity of Latin America and other regions of the world. So in the first slide, I had Tarsila do Amaral with Ava Poru painted in the first third of the 20th century, and Ava Poru is a Tupi word that means man, Abba, who eats people. As a result of predation of nature, we're eating everything. It's a cannibalism resulting in self-destruction. At the same time, Totila Albert, a German-Chilean sculptor, has this La Tierra, Earth, where you see man and woman intersected to create the Earth in a not isolated, not competitive, not lonely, glutonous individual, but in an intercultural, intergender integration that overcomes the dialectic between the conqueror and the conquered, between master and slave, between masculine and feminine, and to fertilize a biocultural reality in a new relationship of co-inhabitation. Regarding the second age, the word is habitat. And the word ethics originated from the Greek term ethos, which in its most archaic form meant a barn or a den. And today, based on ecological sciences, we can interpret it ethos as a protected habitat, which requires life habits of care. And then we have life habits or habits. And the word ethics has also Another origin in Greek in the term ethike, which Aristotle relates to the cultivation of virtues. Today it is critical to cultivate virtues and life habits that regain the consciousness of being co-inhabiting with diverse cultures and other than human beings. And so a biocultural ethics seeks the well-being of the community of all co-inhabitants humans and other than humans with whom we share a habitat that requires care. This framework is applied in several scales. One is in Puerto Williams in the Cape Horn Biosphere Reserve. Here we see the habitats of a wetland with the rushes, with the indigenous Jagan handcrafter, the birds, with the life habits of gathering rushes weaving them and 
ending in a basketry that has centuries of history. In Sado Island, in southern Japan, we have collaborated with philosopher Mitsuyo Toyoda in the restoration of an estuary that had low price for uh, real estate because of over uh, eutrophication. And so the life habit began to be the restoration, planting rushes. Once the water quality improved, reintroducing oysters, seaweeds, and today there are educational activities, gastronomic activities, uh, where people can eat from that uh, estuary. The co-inhabitants are back. And economically, there is a new activity, but also real estate price elevated. So economy and ecology here go hand in hand. So th the first gap I wanted to, to, to address with this systemic and contextual biocultural ethics, which demands conserving and or restoring the vital links between the co-inhabitants, their life habitats, and shared habitats. And the habitats are the condition of possibility for the diversity, both biological and cultural, in the interrelationship to flourish. If not, this would be void words and there is no time. So I will turn now to action and application. So to address in the second gap, I will address the asymmetry in one aspect for reorienting the, the Anthropocene is to improve the gaps in monitoring of global change. I mean, to solve them. Today, the International Network of Long-Term Ecological Studies you see each dot black and you see Japan in the middle and you cannot see the island, you only see the dots. They have so many sites that you cannot see what is below them. Similarly, Europe is a crowd of LTR sites and North America has a relatively well coverage, representative coverage. But until we started our project in the very far south of the Americas in Cape Horn, there was not a single site between 40 and 60 degrees south. Now, to start this, I had to present something that's very obvious, but had not considered so much, that the asymmetry between both hemispheres is maximum at 40, 60 degrees latitudes, where in the northern hemisphere, you see between the white bands there, most of the surface of the planet is land, 54%, and only uh, 45%. Uh, ocean. In contrast, in the southern hemisphere, at the same latitudinal range, you see that it's almost only ocean, 98%, and only that tip is land. That has consequences for climate, for biogeography, etc. But in climates, let me focus here. You see in the upper graph that the temperature in the coldest months in January in Fairbanks, Alaska, is minus 20 degrees Celsius in average. And in average, in August tends to, it's close to 15. So 35 degrees of amplitude in the year. And then in the contrast, in Cape Horn, you have 11 in the warmest month and eight or seven in the coldest month of August. So it's an order of magnitude of difference. This is not trivial because we have been talking about climate change, patterns, etc., based on the measurements made in the north and the south, Sun Hemisphere remain invisible in its details. Now, so invisible that in the 90s, I represented Chile, uh, the process of identifying priority sites uh, for conservation, the hotspots of biodiversity, and then later the wilderness areas. And if you see here in this graph, the very far south of South America is said to be unclassified, unknown. And it took a work to change the lenses and stop looking only at big mammals, at big trees, and look at the small plants of this southern extreme region to see that you see more uh, richness of species of these green bars that are the mosses as compared to vascular plants. That is anomaly because they are over more than 10 times more species of vascular plants than these little mosses in the world. But this anomaly was not only that there are more, but there is more than 6% of all bryophytes or mosses of the world there in less than 0.01% 0 
of the land. So that was our first Eureka, and it meant to change lenses, adding the non-vascular plants. Now, this first Eureka led us to a second milestone, which was to create the Cape Horn Biosphere Reserve through a participatory process of six years, and this is the first world's biofuel reserve created on the basis of the diversity of little plants. I was in Paris and they told me why not to have a whale, a woodpecker, a charismatic plant or animal, and then it will trickle down. Well, we know in Chile, in our experience <laughs> with the Chicago boys, that trickle down does not work. And I'm very happy and proud that we were able to have this proposal approved on the basis of the little lichens and mosses. The third milestone is not only the big diversity, but there was a whole region of the world that was not perceived because everything was encapsulated under the name of Patagonia. And Patagonia means the gauchos, means a flat area, an arid land, and what about this green area that you see on southwestern South America here, which is archipelagic, you navigate, and it's one of the most rainy areas in the world. And I coined this word subantarctic Magellanic ecoregion that inaugurated the relationship between this area and the Antarctic uh, flora too. And so I began with the top 10 biocultural attributes of this region to talk with policymakers, linking land and sea in the interface of marine and terrestrial ecosystem. The first was to point out that there is no geographical replicate. And the red line here uh, touches on Stewart Island, the southernmost island of New Zealand, therefore the southernmost uh, forest outside South America in the Southern Hemisphere. And here Cape Horn emerges as a southern summit of the Americas. So being in Texas, I know that don't mess it with Texas. Here I said, don't mess it with Cape Horn because there is no replicate. And also uh, high latitudes as well as high altitude are particularly sensitive to global warming because if temperature increases there, the biotas have to go to higher altitudes or latitudes and they cannot survive if not. Here, they can become extinct or can be part of the regreening of Antarctica. The other is a unique uh, hot, um, attribute that I want to point out here is that because it was surrounded by the arid Patagonia and the deserts and the Cordillera and the ocean, this has a high endemism like islands. Nine of 10 Vascular plants are endemic, and more than 60% of the little mosses and liverworts. Finally, I want to point out another attribute, which is because it is so remote, it has remained outside the patterns of wind circulation of chemical elements that produce uh, acid precipitation. And acid rain has been absent in this southern extreme of the Americas. Therefore, there is a kind of Jurassic Park with some taxa of invertebrates that have become decimated or even extinct in other regions of the world. Of course, it has also an economic importance because uh, we have the Patagonian ice fields, which are, besides Antarctica, the largest reservoirs of fresh water in the Southern Hemisphere, and is the cleanest waters of the world. Therefore, it has implications for health, and for economy. A fourth milestone was, well, how we convey a message to the Chilean government and the world to communicate this. And then we said Cape Horn is a sentinel site for global climate change and also for planetary sustainability. And this is a process that is still going on, but it was significantly strengthened with the arrival of the optic fiber that connects several points, including Diego Ramirez Island at the very extreme of the shelf there, which is the southernmost island of the Americas, and then Cape Horn and other islands south of Tierra del Fuego, connected to the other centers in Chile and the world today. Now, then a fifth milestone between 2015 and 2019. It was not enough with that part and from 
de Diego Ramírez Archipelago Studies with we discovered sea mounts um, a trench there and we went to propose the creation of the Diego Ramirez Drake Passage Marine Park 15 million hectares which was created on January 21st 2019 so we have a habitat with a name we have a habitat with a protection created with artisanal fisheries, fishers, with industrial fishers, with Yagan indigenous people, with policymakers, and many disciplines working there. And the milestone now is in the making, and I hope we can collaborate on this, is to unify the Cape Horn Biosphere Reserve and the Diego Ramirez Islands Drake Passage Marine Park. This will go to an area of 250,000 square kilometers of terrestrial and marine protected areas at the southern end of the Americas. That is extremely important in a moment that when we talk about climate change, we talk about extinction, we need really to focus on conserving the last few wilderness areas that remain. But also pay attention to the size. It's more than three times larger than whole Bayern and more than six times larger than Switzerland. So, is an area where the current governor, the government, and policymakers and authorities are eager to partner to protect as habitat for the region, for the country, and for the biosphere at the planetary scale. In this context, we got approval in 2014 to fund the design and construction of the Cape Horn International Center in Puerto Williams, which is the southernmost city of the world and the capital city of the Antarctic province of Chile. The building has uh, three areas, one for technical education, mostly but education from the preschool really, to the higher education with emphasis on conservation, gastronomy, and other areas related to tourism of special interest, as well as sustainable energies. Uh, conservation and sustainable tourism is linked to the network of biosphere reserve, particularly the Ibero-American network, and UNESCO will have their uh, a place, an office. And we have also a research area for transdisciplinary long-term socio-ecological research on global change and sustainability. So the Cape Horn International Center is there in Puerto Williams. You see it here in the front. You see it this city, which is a Navy basis, but has the hospital, has now a new infrastructure and is being connected rapidly through new roads that will cross Tierra del Fuego to connect this, as well as a new airport and a Navy port. Today, thanks to the optic fiber, we're connected to several partners in Chile and around the world. And I wanted to combine the first part with the conceptual framework, with this second part of the application, because today is absolutely critical to protect habitats. For the functioning of the planetary biosphere, here is the subantarctic current and other things that affect the northern hemisphere if we conserve there, the well being of human and other than human co inhabitants, and also as a natural co laboratory for the world in the 21st century. So, to value and protect the vital links among the habitats, the life habits, and the co-inhabitants, and thereby contributing to just and sustainable futures, we absolutely require to strengthen global and local collaborations, which is one of the reasons I am so happy to be here at the Rachel Carson Center. And second, with the concept of the biocultural ethics, we propose or I propose a resignification of ethics based on the understanding of the vital links between the life habits and habitats protected for the well-being of the community of human and other than human co-inhabitants. With this very quick overview of the conceptual framework on some of the applications, I really thank you all, but with a strong invitation to collaborate and work together for just and sustainable futures, from the south to the whole biosphere.